Grace. It's me. I am here today and I'm ready to read chapter two. I just wanted to throw this out there real quick. I will not be able to go live anymore because when you go live, you can't have closed captioning. You might be able to have it, but it would be auto captions and they are not accurate at all. So, I will be recording it beforehand so that I can go through and hand caption it myself, type all of it, but I would still love to hear your thoughts on the story, what you like, what you don't like, what you're predicting might happen next, so feel free just to comment down below each chapter and let me know. Let me know what you think about the book. So today is chapter two, and it is entitled, The Pond. The pond Sam had discovered on that spring morning was seldom visited by any human being. All winter, snow had covered the ice. The pond lay cold and still under its white blanket. Most of the time, there wasn't a sound to be heard. The frog was asleep. The chipmunk was asleep. Occasionally, a jay would cry out, and sometimes at night, the fox would bark. A high, rasping bark. Winter seemed to last forever. But one day, a change came over the woods and the pond. Warm air, soft and kind, blew through the trees. The ice, which had softened during the night, began to melt. Patches of open water appeared. All the creatures that lived in the pond and in the woods were glad to feel the warmth. They heard and felt the breath of spring, and they stirred with new life and hope. There was a good new smell in the air, a smell of earth waking after its long sleep. The frog, buried in the mud at the bottom of the pond, knew that spring was here. The chickadee knew and was delighted. Almost everything delights a chickadee. The vixen, dozing in her den, knew she would soon have kits. Every creature knew that a better, easier time was at hand. Warmer days. Pleasanter nights. Trees were putting out green buds. The buds were swelling. Birds began arriving from the south. A pair of ducks flew in. The red-winged blackbird arrived and scouted the pond for nesting sites. A small sparrow with a white throat arrived and sang, Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And if you have been sitting by the pond on that first warm day of spring, suddenly, toward the end of the afternoon, you would have heard a stirring sound high above you in the air. A sound like the sound of trumpets. Kahoo! Kahoo! And if you had looked up, you would have seen high overhead two great white birds. They flew swiftly, their legs stretched out straight behind, their long white necks stretched out ahead, their powerful wings beating steadily and strong. Kahoo! Kahoo! A thrilling noise in the sky, the trumpeting of swans. When the birds spotted the pond, they began circling, looking the place over from the air. Then they glided down and came to rest in the water, folding their long wings neatly along their sides and turning their heads this way and that to study their new surroundings. They were trumpeter swans, pure white birds with black bills. They had liked the looks of the swampy pond and had decided to make it their home for a while and raise a family. The two swans were tired from the long flight. They were glad to be down out of the sky. They paddled slowly about and then began feeding, thrusting their necks into the shallow water and pulling roots and plants from the bottom. Everything about the swans was white, except their bills and their feet. These were black. They carried their heads high. The pond seemed a little different place because of their arrival. For the next few days, the swans rested. 
When they were hungry, they ate. When they were thirsty, which was a great deal of the time, they drank. On the tenth day, the female began looking around to find a place to build her nest. In the spring of the year, nest building is utmost in a bird's mind. It is the most important thing there is. If she picks a good place, she stands a good chance of hatching her eggs and rearing her young. If she picks a poor place, she may fail to raise a family. The female swan knew this. She knew the decision was making was extremely important. Excuse me. She knew the decision she was making was extremely important. The two swans first investigated the upper end of the pond where a stream flowed slowly in. It was pleasant there with reeds and bulrushes. Red-winged blackbirds were busy nesting in this part of the pond and a pair of mallard ducks were courting. Then the swans swam to the lower end of the pond, a marsh with woods on one side and a deer meadow on the other. It was lonely here. From one shore, a point of land extended out into the pond. It was a sandy strip like a little peninsula and at the tip of it, a few feet out into the water, was a tiny island hardly bigger than a dining table. One small tree grew on the island and there were rocks and ferns and grasses. Take a look at this, exclaimed the female as she swam around and round. Hoo replied her husband who liked to have someone ask his advice. The swan stepped cautiously out onto the island. The spot seemed made to order, just right for a nesting place. While the male swan floated close by watching, she snooped about until she found a pleasant spot on the ground. She sat down to see how it felt to be sitting there. She decided it was the right size for her body. It was nicely located a couple of feet from the water's edge. Very convenient. She turned to her husband. What do you think? She said. An ideal location, he re replied. A perfect place, and I will tell you why. It's a perfect place. He continued majestically. If an enemy, a fox or a coon or a coyote or a skunk, wanted to reach this spot with murder in his heart, he'd have to enter the water and get wet. And before he could enter the water, he'd have to walk the whole length of the point of that land. And by the time we'd, we'd see him or hear him, an eye would give him a hard time. The male stretched out his great wings eight feet from tip to tip and gave the water a mighty clout to show his strength. This made him feel better right away. When a trumpeter swan hits an enemy with his wing, it's like being hit by a baseball bat. A male swan, by the way, is called a cob. No one knows why, but that's what he's called. A good many animals have special names. A male goose is called a gander. A male cow is called a bull. A male sheep is called a ram. A male chicken is called a rooster, and so on. Anyway, the thing to remember is that a male swan is called a cob. The cob's wife pretended not to notice that her husband was showing off, but she saw it all right, and she was proud of his strength and his courage. As husbands go, he was a good one. The cob watched his beautiful wife sitting there on the tiny island. To his great joy, he saw her begin to turn slowly round and around, keeping always in the same spot, treading the mud and grass. She was making the first motions of nesting. First she squatted down in the place she had chosen. Then she twisted round and around, tamping the earth with her, with her broad webbed feet hollowing it out to make it like a saucer. Then she reached out and pulled twigs and grasses toward her and dropped them at her sides and under her tail, shaping the nest to her body. The cob floated close to his mate. He studied every move she made. Now another medium-sized stick, my love, he said, and she poked her splendid long white graceful neck as far as it would go, picked up a stick and placed it at her side. Now another bit of coarse grass, said the cob with great dignity. 
The female reached for grasses, for moss, for twigs, anything that was handy. Slowly, carefully, she built up the nest until she was sitting on a big grassy mound. She worked at the task for a couple of hours and then knocked off for the day and slid into the pond again to take a drink and have lunch. A fine start, said the cob as he gazed back at the nest. Nest, a perfect beginning. I don't know how you manage it so cleverly. It comes naturally, replied the wife. There's a lot of work to it, but on the whole, it is pleasant work. Yes, said the cob. And when you're done, you have something to show for your trouble. You have a swan's nest six feet across. What other bird can say that? Well, said his wife, maybe an eagle can say it. Yes, but in that case, it wouldn't be a swan's nest. It would be an eagle's nest, and it would be high up in some old dead tree somewhere, instead of right down near the water with all the conveniences that go with water. They both laughed at this. Then they began trumpeting and splashing and scooping up water and throwing it on their backs, darting about as though they had suddenly gone crazy with delight. Coo-hoo! 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 They cried. Every wild creature within a mile and a half of the, per the pond heard the trumpeting of the swans. The fox heard, the raccoon heard, the skunk heard. One pair of ears heard that did not belong to a wild creature, but the swans did not know that. All right, well, that's the end of chapter two. I have a question for you. What pair of ears are they talking about in chapter two that didn't belong to a wild creature? Maybe you remember from chapter one what his name was, but I cannot wait to do chapter three and to see what you guys think of this book. Um, it's really good to me, but you can have a different opinion. That's okay. I will talk to you very soon, okay? Much love. <laughs>